James chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Actually, we will, but anyhow. As we cover this, I, it is interesting. I have the title, The Eschatological, Joy-Filled, Faith-Driven Life, because it is, it's the only way to define all of this. It is, if you want an interpretive uh, outline, I mean, uh, heading for the passage. I want to talk about the eschatologically driven believer's response to God-ordained circumstances. And I think you'll understand that as we walk through this section today. The other would be very simply a joyful, confident, faith-driven living is, is the emphasis of the passage. I bring you back to this. It is the foundation of the pyramid we talk about so often. But what our concern is, is looking into Scripture and saying, what is the principle that God would have me garner from this passage today for my life? And that's the question. And it is a principle that is God's word driven, not a principle. We can have principle living and it can be our own principles. These are God driven principles that must drive our life. And again, I remind you, I take this quotation from 1 Corinthians 4, 6, do not go beyond what stands written. We, we must stay in the Word of God. It is what drives us. It is the only thing that should drive us. Nothing else. Uh, your opinion, my opinion, doesn't matter. His opinion is the only thing that does matter. Several key issues about this book. It is a book written by a Jewish author to professing Jewish believers. I believe the author is James, the brother of our Lord. Even as early as this morning, I, or later this morning, I'm just, again, going over some of the different authors and their view of who wrote this book. And it's amazing. The more critical, quote unquote, they are, the more intelligent they seem to project themselves to be, the more, th anyhow, whatever. They come to the conclusion that James, who wrote this, was not the brother of our Lord. But may I suggest to you, he was the brother of our Lord. That is what... We are going to accept this. What is he was a Jewish author writing to professing Jewish believers. As a result, <clears throat> the language is very picturesque. If you just listen to Jesus uh, as he talks, and we're going to, uh, Pastor Stephen's going to take us through the uh, Sermon on the Mount in just a few weeks, and the the words of our Lord, the teaching of our Lord, are so picturesque as is that of his brother James. Very, very picturesque. We'll see that even more clearly next week. The other part of this is the progression is Hebrew. I, I can't emphasize this enough to you. I will keep emphasizing it to you over and over again because if you begin to see what so many authors do, Paul does it, Jesus does it, James does it, they move from thought to thought to thought. Now, as we begin this, I want you to see this because there is a progression of thought through this passage without a doubt. Here, here is the message of James 1, 1 to 12. Well, actually, just the first few verses. Notice, if you will, in this context, the word you have that's translated Greece, greeting, it, let me go back, the word you have translated, I have translated rejoicing here, it's translated greeting in your text, but it goes from joy in verse 1 to joy in verse 2. It goes from endurance in verse 3 to in Vern's in verse 4, it goes from perfect result to perfect uh, in, again in verse 4 again. Lacking to lack, let him ask to let him ask, doubting to doubt. It's, just, it's interesting because one thought leads to another thought, leads to another thought, leads to another thought. And you can see this, it just is throughout this whole section so clearly here. Easier to see in Greek than it is in English, but it's still very evident there. But you think that in doing this is somebody losing their train of thought, but they're not, because I want to show you something. There's continuity. You can't miss the continuity. And, and so many, if, if you look at your text, I look at both texts I have, the English and the Greek text. It has verses 2 to 8 as one section, verses 9 to 11 as another section, and then verses 12 and following is another section, but it's not true. They separate this up, but it's not separated. Let me show you. <clears throat> if you see the continuity, it makes all the difference in the world. I'm taking verses 2 to 3 and verse 12 just by themselves. Look at something here. If you look at verse 2, he talks about trials. I would say to you, first of all, they're external 
trials, the trials that come into our life from outside of ourselves. It's, it's found in, in first part of this passage, talks about the variegated trials we go through in verse 2. When you come down to verse 12, blessed is the man who endures these trials. So you see verse 12 is connected with verse 2. The approved, if you look at the word in verse, let's start with verse, verse 12. Because when he is approved, well now the same word translated approved in verse 12 is the one that is translated in verse uh, 2 and 3, the testing. Now it isn't a testing, and I'll talk to you about that here. It's the approved part of your faith from the same word. So he talks about the approved part of, verse, of our faith in verse 3, and we'll cover that today. He talks about being approved in verse 12. So all he's doing in verse 12 is summing up the thought of verses 2 and 3. Then he talks about endurance in verse 3 and talks about endurance in verse 12 as well. It, it, it's translated in the text, I have perseveres, but it's the same word. Now, now, the point I'm making by this is that although he goes from thought to thought to thought to thought, there is a continuity of thought in this whole section that must not be missed. For if it is missed, we miss the point the author is attempting to make, and many do. Let me just say to you, if you take verses 9 to 11 and separate them from verses 2 to 12, you miss the whole point of verses 9 through 11. That's why in the various texts we have where somebody is separated, and you understand that's their choice, they separate verses 9 to 11 as a separate heading, they miss, therefore, the whole point of the passage. And if you and I do that, we will miss so much of what God has to say to us. Now, I want to talk about eschatological for this reason, in case you haven't heard me use it much before or don't get the feel of it. I was driving home from church one Sunday with my dear mother, and my dear mother, a very godly woman, and so she says to me, she says, son, what's this eschatological living you're talking about? And so I'm able to, and she understood pretty quickly, but an eschatological person is a person who allows the present to be shaped by the future. And I just, just think about that. The future shapes the present. If it doesn't, we're not eschatological. Now, you just, you just think about that for a moment. You know, and then let me go to the other side, too. An eschatological person doesn't allow present circumstances or people to shape the present. Okay? Circumstances come and somehow we let that shape our lives. We dare not let that happen. We must let the future shape the present, not the present shape the present. It's huge to us. It's important. Oh, you know what I didn't do? Okay. I'm going to, well, it's, okay. I forgot it. But anyhow, let's go there. With that in mind, reflect with me on the following. An eschatological person seeks only the approval of God. That is, that's in this passage and in the passage follows so it's so big. You see, the whole point of verse 12 is blessed is the man, you see. Blessed is the man or the woman you see, who endures under trials, for once he has been approved, and that's by God, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. See, the approval of God is all that matters in life. If the approval of man is what drives us, it is going to cause us to have an unbelievably disturbing life. It just will. We're going to go up and down and backwards and forwards because we're seeking the approval of man rather than the approval of God. Desire of life is only to seek the approval of God. By the way, if you have the approval of God guaranteed, you're going to make an impact and positively on man. An eschatological person gains the approval of God only when he or she endures. We'll talk about that in a passage today. That is this big with God. God is into endurance. He's into the long haul, okay? But let me, let me do this. This is the book of Hebrews, just for a moment. I want to show you something. This is Hebrews 10 through 12. Hebrews 10, the endure, word endurance is found for the first time in the whole book of Hebrews, in verses 32 and 36, the only time, in the, the first time in the book, okay? And it's interesting because he says you endured in verse 32, and then he says you have need of endurance. And by the way, let me just pause for a while there. <laughs> he doesn't compare the believers with God. That would be something that would cause them to change. 
He doesn't compare the believers here with some godly figure like Abraham or Isaac. That would cause you to somehow change. But he compares the believers with themselves. Think about that for a moment. He says there was a day when you did show this kind of life, but you don't anymore. Let me ask you a question. Are you on the same spiritual level that you were at the point where you were in the height of your walk with God? I think back to the early days. I first met my wife in those years. There, what, what drew us together was this kind of a life. And, and, but you see, somehow as life goes on, sometimes he compares them with themselves and says, you're not even as spiritual as you used to be. I'm not even comparing you with myself. I'm not comparing you with a godly man. I'm comparing you with yourself and saying, you're not where you used to be. You used to be this way. You're no longer this way. So endurance is found here. And he says, you used to have it, but somehow it's missing. Now, the next time is found, and the only other time in Hebrews is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, 2, 3, and 7. Okay? Consider him, he says, who endured. That's Christ, okay? Now, now, in between these two sections is Hebrews 11, which is a chapter on faith. Now, now just stop with me for a while, because why, what is the significance of that? Now, <clears throat> let me bring that to the whole point of this passage, Hebrews 10 to 12, is this. Because you know chapter 11 is on faith. A faith that is real is a faith that endures. See, see, God isn't into this, you know, jumping in and then jumping up. Take Samson. How come he gets in this list? I just read about Samson this last week in Judges. What a messed up life. But, but you know, when he, at the end, he didn't say God caused this building to fall. He believed God. He says, lead me to where those two pillars are, he says to this young kid in his blindness. And he grabs those pillars and he pulls them and he believes God. And more people died in his death than died in his life. Why? He had a faith that endured. Slip, fall, move back, yes. But in the end, you pull through. Are you with me? All of us were bound to have those times we falter. The issue with God is, though, do we rebound? Do we come back? Love the verse in Proverbs when it talks about the unrighteous man falling. You see, and they get back up, but the righteous man falls time and time again, and he gets back up again. That's what a righteous man does. God is after endurance. He wants a faith that endures, a faith that lasts, a faith that comes back after the failure, right? And resumes that role again with God. So endurance is huge. And I come back here again. An eschatological person understands that the approval of God comes only to those who bear up under God-ordained circumstances. Not run away, not shy away, no bear up, endure under God-ordained circumstances. Now, so an eschatological person truly understands that all external trials are God-ordained. They are. Don't, don't ever forget that. The trials of life come and they're many. They are to you, they are to me. And then they become devastating. But you see, they're God-ordained. If you don't see this, all of a sudden you start, you know, becoming bitter at other people because they did it. No, it's God-ordained. Again, I just finished reading Judas Iscariot betraying the Lord, the last part of Matthew. And the Lord goes into trial and doesn't answer, doesn't in any way defend himself. And you watch this kind of thing because he understood the trial was God ordained, was it not? Judas did it, but God ordained it. Are you with me? It's true. Father, he says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I know it's under your control. Hear me. Every external trial that comes into your life is God-ordained. You must understand that, you see. Not temptations, but trials. Therein lies the message of this whole passage. Just as. So now, with that in mind, let me go back. I come back to something I continually talk about. The church is God's church. It's not your church. It's not my church. This is God's church. It doesn't belong to us. I remind you of that because it's so easy for us to think this is our church. We can do what we want. No, this is his church. He does as he wishes with his church. He does. 
It's the message of all of Scripture. So in light of this, God rules or directs his church and his children through three things. His God-inspired word, his God-gifted people, and God-ordained circumstances. And the focus is here on the last one, God-ordained circumstances. The circumstances that God ordains. By the way, how, this is what we, I would enjoy for leadership meetings. I enjoy for your own personal life. This is how you must assess what you should do day by day. First of all, God's word. Secondly, God's giftedness. What has God gifted you to do? And then God ordained circumstances. Put the three of those together and you will determine the mind of God. But you must see that those circumstances are God ordained. So we've already seen in this message, okay, the relationship you see with two, uh, three to 12. And so there's continuity there between these things. But now, I take you from there because verse 13 is the beginning of the new paragraph. But I want to sum up verses 2 to 12 for you here so you see something. In verses 2 to 12, and I have the Greek word on purpose in the Greek here because I don't want you to get confused. I do this for a purpose, for, for this reason. I'm not trying to show off anything. That's not what I'm about. I didn't use Greek or Hebrew for a long time. People who often use it are people who are trying to show off and they really don't know much about it. That's not the purpose of this. I want you to see that what I'm telling you is directly from the word and not something I'm imposing upon it. It's easy to just preach a message and tell you what I'd like to say, but far better to show you. When you look at the word, it's the noun in verses 2 to 12. Only the noun for testing is the verb in verses 13 and following. In verses 2 to 12, the trials that come, the external trials, are definitely from God. No doubt. No doubt. But when verse 13 happens, the same root word is used, but now it's the verb. And it has to do not with external trials, but inner temptations, the inner solicitation to evil, if you will. Now watch something, because I'm going to do the Greek word, and I want you to see something. Even if you don't know Greek, you can see that the first part of each of these words is exactly the same four letters. They're related. The trials of verses 2 to 12, the temptation of verses 13 and following, all come from the same root, but there's a difference. The trials in verses 2 to 12 come from God. When it comes down to verses 13 and following, notice what it says without a doubt. It says, let no one, verse 13, say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. Don't you dare do that, okay? In other words, I, God says, am responsible for the trials in your life, but I have absolutely nothing to do with the temptation that come in your life. And they're related, but God is not tied in with the second. He brings the first. He has definitely nothing to do with the latter at all. At all. You see, if you respond to trials properly, you will see God's purpose in those trials. If you don't respond properly and find your own way out, there is where temptation comes from. It does. It is this very important. Um, God gives you a financial trial. You trust God through that financial trial and see him bring about a resolution. That is awe-inspiring. It is. Um, there's a dear friend, and they, the person said to me, tell me how much you need. And I said, never, it won't happen. I said, it's so exciting for me to see a time when there is a need and God speaks to your heart or to the heart of others and he provides exactly what's needed. Recently, there was an expenditure we had to make, so we made it. I knew, no, had no idea how it would be paid for. I had lunch with this individual and the individual knowing nothing about, I wouldn't because I don't discuss the cost with anybody, hands me a check just quite like this and I look at it, and it was the exact amount of what I just paid out. And you see, they didn't know, okay? But it's fun to watch God do what God does. But see, in the midst of these financial trials, if we find our own way out, try to cheat the government on the taxes, find some way to take money from work, whatever in the world we do see, that is where the temptation comes in. God brought the trial and the way out of it, right? Right? By the way, let me cross-reference for a moment here, but it's a passage I love. There's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is able, huh, will not suffer us to be tempted above what we are able, 
Understand, I didn't memorize the authorized version, so that's why I'm staying, okay? But will provide, and it's not a way of escape. There's an article, he provides the way to escape. God has a way out of every trial he brings us into, his way. But the minute we divert to go our way, therein comes the temptation, if you will. Are you with me? So there is the difference between verses 2 to 12 and 13 and following. But I bring you back then. This is God's church. He rules it. He does it through his word, through his giftedness, and through God-ordained circumstances. And the focus here on the latter. Notice the progression. I just, I, this is the outline of the passion. Of doubt. The principles presented in verses 2 to 4, the need for a joy-filled life. The principle is expanded upon verses 5 to 8, the need for a faith-filled life. The principle is illustrated, verses 9 to 11, the need for a totally dependent life. And then finally, the whole principle is summed up in verse 12, the need for an eschatologically driven life. And so this is, this is the passage tied together. He states the principle, he expands upon it, he illustrates it, and then he concludes. It's a great, I mean, it's his message, it's his outline, so we will follow it best we can. The principle, the need for a joy-filled life. Now, when we talk about a joy-filled life, and we're going to see this because as it comes to this passage, it's interesting, I, I will read for you, verse, I'm reading verse 2, all joy count it, my brethren, whenever you fall into the midst of and are surrounded by variegated multicolored trials, I'm translating if you will, because you know from experience that the approved part of your faith produces endurance. Now, let me start with it because. Interesting word here, this word testing of your faith is how you have it in your rendering more than likely, but it's not true. It's not what it should be, and I'll explain this to you. Go with me, I could easily explain it by just the word, and I will in a moment. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, where he, the only other time the same form of the word is used, okay? In James chapter 1 and verse 7. I start in verse 6, translating, in which you greatly rejoice, though now, if necessary, you are being again tested, or it's not tested, but when you test it, in variegated trials, in order that the approved part of your faith being more precious than gold, which perishes, having been tried through fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory of the revelation of Christ. Now, <clears throat> I want to do that because the approved part of your faith is the word. The word, it's because this is back to James, okay, because we know. It, let me tell you about because we know it's a causal participle is what we call it, and that's, that's the reason why we, we can do this, that the approved part of your faith. Now, the approved part of your faith, it comes from the word dokimazo. You can see the words related, even if you don't know the language. It comes from the word dokimazo, which not doesn't mean to test, but test for the sake of approving. That's what it means. But by the way, let me say something. Testing doesn't necessarily produce endurance, not by itself. I've seen people tested, and uh, they don't learn much endurance at all. It's how you respond to that. See, so the word is not testing. It is the approved part. It comes from this word as the result of testing. And, and you see, God continually tests our hearts in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. But, but listen to me, the approved part of faith is that part of faith that holds on to God and nobody or nothing else in the midst of trials. That's the faith that's approved. Listen to me. God is not going to approve faith, okay, that holds on to him plus something else. That's not approved faith. The approved faith holds only on to God in the midst of trials, nothing else, no one else. Nothing else, no one else. Jesus said it. You can't serve what? You can't serve God and mammon. You can't hold on to God and money at this. You can't do it, okay? We'll come back to that. So the word is approved part. Now, I want to take further into James. The proof of it being more precious than gold. My faith is more precious than gold. Your faith is more precious than gold. But gold is, go, why? Because gold is perishable. Now abideth these three, faith, hope, and love, right? They're the things that abide. But it's interesting because gold is perishable, though tested by fire. The only way to purify gold, to make it really something you want to buy for your wife, you see, 
Some gold you see is not to purify like this, but real purified gold. The only way to purify it is to, is to put it under intense heat over and over and over again, and all the impurities go out, and then the pure gold is left. Now, it is interesting because the picture, Weiss does it in his uh, word pictures, and it's, it's a very vibrant uh, picture. When they refined gold, back then they took it in a huge cauldron and put it over intense heat, very intense heat. And as they did so, the impurities would start to rise to the top and they'd skim the impurities off. They put them off to the side. The part that is left here is the dokimos, the approved part. The part that was put off the side is odd dokimos, unapproved. But it was enough to do this once. They did it again and again and again. And the intense heat kept coming. The skimming kept happening. And finally, they would come to the end where this was concluded. And, and how he said they knew when it was time to quit was when the person purifying the gold could look down in the cauldron and see a reflection of himself in it. Listen, the only time the testing of your faith will conclude is when God can look down and see a reflection of himself in you. That's what it's all about. He wants to see you look more like him. He wants to see me look more like him. And the only way to do it is this way. It has to be through intense heat. And the heat in the believer's life are the trials that come, are they not? And that is what God does, not for the sake of damaging us, but for the sake of purifying us. So when you look at this, in the context of this, the gold or faith is subjected to great heat. Now, let me talk to you about faith. Multicolored, and he talks about it in the passage, and I take it back to James, because James and 1 Peter, both of them have the word multicolored trials. Uh, you know, the trials of God are never the same. Boy, they're never the same. They could be financial trials, but they don't look the same each time. Because you finally figure God out and say, okay, I know what God's going to do. And God never does it the same way twice. On purpose. But see, the multicolored financial trials provide the heat for purification. They do. Even what God is doing now, it's so easy to look and say, why uh, the cost of everything going up and so forth? You say, you can look at that and say that. But see, God is doing it for our sakes. He is for us as believers. There's a reason he's doing it. And so he wants to, through this, bring purification. He does. <clears throat> Multicolored physical trials. I love the statement of a dear godly farmer's wife down in California when her niece was visiting. And her niece has their youngest son is his brain damaged in every portion. Um, he's older now, he's in his 40s, but anyhow, it would be the rest of his life this way. And she looked at the dear mother and she says, God must really love you. And she says, why do you say that? And he says, to think that he can trust you with so much. I've never forgotten that. From the words of a farmer's wife, to think he can trust you with so much. Physical trials, they come for that purpose. God wants to purify through them. They're not something we look at negatively, something we see positively to realize what God is trying to do. Emotional trials, they provide heat for purification, they do. See, these aren't accidents, they happen. They're God-ordained. Now, in light of this, though tested by fire, the impurities are skimmed off. Listen to me. <clears throat> Any dependence upon health rather than dependence upon God must be skimmed off. It has to be. It is, it's an amazing thing, you see. We start to depend on the wrong thing because God has made us healthy. We think we can do it, and God wants to tell you, you can't do it. Only I can do it. Without me, you can do what? Nothing, Right? But see, we become dependent upon what we can do physically. And then God has to remind us once in a while. Any dependence upon wealth rather than upon God must be skimmed off. He just has to do it. It's the only way he can do it. 
Any dependence upon success rather than upon God must be skimmed off. You start looking and say, boy, I can do this job. I'm good at it. No, no, no. You see, this is why. I'm going to go back to it again. I can't go back to it enough. When I meet Moses, Moses is a shepherd. God meets him with a burning bush because he understands that, right? He's got to shepherd millions of people, and God's going to take him from there and going to show him that he can't do it without God, and so therefore the miracles that happen there. When God meets Joshua, he doesn't meet him as a shepherd. He meets him as a soldier. Joshua says to him, you for us or against us? He says, I'm the captain. Take the shoes off your feet. This is holy ground. Then he tells this man who's so skilled, skilled as a warrior, he says, go march around Jericho once. Then march around Jericho again. The seventh day, march around seven times and blow the trumpets and yell. And he says, this isn't how you fight a war, but you're the captain and this is what we'll do. And the walls came down. See, Joshua didn't fit the battle. God fit the battle of Jericho, right? God had to meet him where he was. Peter? The greatest messages to Peter happened in the water. He's a fisherman. The net's breaking. The walking in the water, see. See, God needs to meet. I, I love the passage where he says, you know, you, we fished all night, caught nothing. He says, okay, throw your nets in on the other side. And you, you want to hear Peter say, okay, I'm a fisherman. You're a carpenter. What are you telling me how to fish for, see? Nevertheless, he says, at your wish. And so he throws the net on the other side, you're right. And they had to bring people over to help him with the net because it was so heavy with fish. I tell you, whatever your occupation is, no matter how successful you are, he knows more about your business than you do. He does. Sat with an 85 year old man just a week and a half ago. He worked in building airplanes. He says, so often, he says, I'd go home at night. He has no college degree. Yet he went so far in the business, but he said, I go home at night. I just pray the Lord and say, give me wisdom. They, they, we've got to figure out something to do here. And he says over and over again, God would intervene and show me how to do it. Do you believe that? I believe that, see. God will meet you where you are to take you where you need to go. But don't ever depend upon your success. Depend upon him. With that in mind, then. Though tested by fire. See, the purified gold reflects its refiner. God purifies, refines our faith through financial trials so he can see a reflection of himself in us. You know, we, we, we have to see it way ahead. Jesus in the Lord's Prayer. Give us, it's emphatic, my friend. Give us this day the bread of this day. We Americans are not satisfied if we can't see how God's going to provide next month. God says today, right? sufficient for the day, Right? Are the trials of it right? Don't be taking on tomorrow's burdens. How are you going to pay the bill tomorrow? It's not your business, it's his. I'm telling you it is. Trust me, it is. Never forget the day. We had a bill due in the house, and we had no payments to make. and went down to the post office box, and there was a check. I've seen it happen too often, okay? Way too often. He wants to see himself enough. And you think when Jesus came down this earth... He could have worked 60 hours a week. He could have. But you know what he did? And it was, it was these people provided. He just trusted. He, he did. He lived the life that we should live. Not mean he shouldn't work. That's not the point. You understand something, though. He watched God provide, and he lived that life of simple faith. God purifies and refines our faith through physical trials so we can see reflection of himself in us. And he does the same through emotional trials, he does. Okay, now back to this passage. The call for a joyful faith. Now, now, I want you to see something. When you start this passage, and I have it right here so you can see it. Pasan karan he gesas the. He starts out, though, the, then down in the fourth and fifth word are my brothers. You know what? Let me start with here. Only one who's been begotten by God can do this. You, you can't do this as a non-Christian. It doesn't work. All the effort in the world, it won't work. It's impossible to naturally do. It's supernaturally done. But, but having said that, may I put in the other side to this? On the other hand, everyone who is begotten again by God must do this. This is, not, this is not a choice. I have a choice in this? No, it's a command, okay? So he's starting out with a command at the very beginning of this. But I want you to see something. Why, why this becomes interesting is because... 
The command comes to those who have fallen into the midst of. The word that is translated fall into the midst of here comes from two Greek words, peri and pipto. Now, the peri words, you know, it's perimeter, okay? It's around. So the idea is you fall into the midst of, that's the pipto word, and you're surrounded by, that's the peri word. And so when you find yourself in circumstances where you've fallen into the midst of some circumstance, financial circumstance, physical circumstance, emotional circumstance that's overwhelming, you fall into the midst of that and find yourself totally overwhelmed. God, there's no way out of this. No way out of this. By the way, he likes you to be there. He does like you to be there. In fact, he keeps taking you back there because, you see, if you start getting too dependent upon yourself, he's got to remind you. And so you, you, he brings these trials for this reason. So you fall in the midst of, and you're completely surrounded by these external trials that totally overwhelm you. And those of you who are men here and you, you, the responsibility for families and you feel the pressure falling upon you, just remember, you are not the provider he is. I've worked three jobs for years. Okay, I didn't work it for money, but I've done it. And you work from one to the other and they overlap, but it doesn't matter. The whole point of it is you understand, even when you do this, you understand, I am not the provider for my family, he is. So one day I finished praying at the meal, for the meal, and one of the kids pipes up and says, Daddy, how come you're thanking God for the food when you're the one who goes out and earns the money? You see, I, this is a great open door to say, do you understand why I have the strength, why I have the job, right? Why we have this is because of him. By the way, when you forget that, he'll remind you of it. He will. So the setting is very clear, by the way. You fall in the midst of, and by the way, it's unexpectedly because it's the aorist tense here. It's, it's not when you are continuously, but when, you happen, when it happens to you. And then it says whenever it, whenever it happens, every time this happens to you. Every time, every time, every time this happens to you. See, I've been over this past so often, but every time I come back here, I move because it is so easy to be moved away from here. It, it isn't, and by the way, it's not after it happens to you, it's not a month later, it's not an hour later, it's exactly at the point it happens. This is what we're supposed to do. So we fall into the midst of, and we are completely surrounded by variegated, multicolored external trials. Okay? This is the setting. And when we find ourselves there, if we come back here because it is interesting, I bring you back whenever you fall unexpectedly in the midst of these trials, every time it happens, whenever it happens. And here's interesting because look at the first two words of the entire text of this book, all joy, and now the third word, count it. You know, if, if this book has anything to do with it, it's all joy. Nothing but joy, nothing but joy in the midst of trials. Nothing but joy. Tough as they are, nothing but joy. Nothing but joy. Count it. That's how the book begins. First three words in the entire book. Not about trials, it's about joy. But it's interesting because I put in there this joy comes because of a faith, a life of faith, so does endurance. So you see here, notice, it counted nothing but joy. I would, I, I, you could say totality of joy, all joy. You can do that if you want, and it's uncomfortable that. I would render it nothing but joy. It cannot be joy plus something else. It's always joy. By the way, it's interesting because this, this joy here is Karan, which is an inner kind of a joy. When Peter does it, go to 1 Peter 1, look at it sometime, in verse 7, he uses the word in verses 6 and 7, agaliasta, which is a, I call it a Toyota joy. And I'll tell you why Toyota joy, you know that advertising they used to have where you jump up in the air and click your heels. This, this is an expressive joy. It's not this, I have the joy, 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 joy down in my heart stuff. That's good. But you have to express this joy in the midst of trials, expressive joy in the midst of trials. So here we are. We are to count it nothing but joy at the precise moment of time when this happens to us. The car breaks down on the freeway at that precise moment of time. Count it nothing but joy. 
A broken bone happens, count it nothing but joy. Yeah, we get the letter from the IRS last year. You owe an extra so much thousand dollars. We ultimately didn't, but it's, it's one of those things that comes unexpectedly and you count it nothing but joy and then start writing them letters. But you see, it's count it nothing but joy. God brings those trials for his purpose. Now, it's, it's a joy-filled one, and I, I've done this because this is First Peter, but let me show you something. This is, this is how I've, I've put First Peter, by the way, pushes everything to the middle. The middle thought is the most important thought, so he starts from the outside. As we focus our attention fully on God's future promised salvation, our future living hope, as we do that, we place our full trust completely on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? As we do that, then we will rejoice, okay, expressively and exuberantly, no matter how great the trial may be, and it's all in the middle, no matter how great the trial, we can do this. By the way, we can do this. Okay, I go by this same thing again because I, okay, I modified it, didn't, but here we go. The call for an enduring faith, verse 3. Notice something. When you start this in James 1, you notice what he starts out with. He says, count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall in the midst of variegated trials, because you know that the approved part of your faith produces endurance. See, God's after endurance. He, he, he wants us to hang in there for the long haul. And it's an enduring faith. Because the approved part of our faith, see, approved part of our faith which holds on to God alone produces endurance. That's the only thing that will produce endurance. The only way you can hang in there. By the way, you can sit there and say, oh, boy, I'm going to endure. I'm going to hang in under this. I'm going to be the man. Okay, no, no, no. The only way you can do this is by faith. This isn't something you engender from within yourself. It's something that God does as you hold on to him. But I want you to see this because, notice if you will, but let endurance have its perfect work or complete work, if you will, probably better. In order that you might be mature. Now, let me go back. The interesting part of this, okay, we know the Christian life is about maturity. It's about being mature. We want to be mature Christians, but maturity isn't all of it. Go back to the next word this time, this halakli roy. You know what this is? This, you remember when they brought an animal for sacrifice, some of them were rejected because it had to be an animal with all its parts? Two ears, right? Everything had to be there. No, no blemishes, okay? Now, that's the word here. Now, <clears throat> what is interesting for many of us, we are very mature in certain parts of our life. But there are parts of our life that uh, we don't even want to go there because we know it's something we're not comfortable with handling. So God says, you know what? I'm not only interested in maturity. I want completeness. I want every part of your spiritual life developed. And I'm going to push you to force you to develop parts of your life that you never would develop were I not to cause you to do this. And um, why well, I start reflecting on this. For those, I mean, for some of us, what happens is when trials come, we, we, we understand, okay, certain things we can cope with, certain things we can't. And so therefore, we, we just want to internalize the things we can't and hopefully hope that they'll go away. For example, we as men may be able to handle all the pressures at work, but we come home with the pressures at home and we don't want to deal with them. God says, well, I'll show you because I'm going to open up areas of your life that you never wanted to go into. As a dear man know in the mission field, he would never play a game he couldn't win at. And so uh, there was only two games he played because he could beat everybody at one day. Another young guy and I, we challenged him and another fellow who was visiting who was supposed to be the other best one or whatever, and we beat him big time. They wouldn't play with us again. He wouldn't play with us again. Play checkers because he could win checkers. He had, he had games he could win, he'd play at. Uh, he just, that's how he did. He stayed in areas where he was comfortable. God wants to take us to those areas where we're not comfortable. And we, we don't want to go there. And if we, he didn't take us there, we wouldn't go there either. So that's what he does with trials. He takes us to places we would never want to go. 
Because God doesn't want us lacking in any part of our life. The whole part of life strengthened by God's grace. Okay, now, faith. You come down to verse, there's this section, you understand something. It's, it's interesting because faith is the interesting part of this whole section. It really is. It's a joyful, faith-filled life. But faith is what brings the joy. Faith is what brings the endurance. So he comes to verse 5 and says, all right, if you have need of this, okay? Now, all of us have need for this dependent life. And so he says, let him ask or let her ask of God. You know, the answer to the problems of life is prayer. Let him or her ask of God. I think of this because you know who did this? James the just, James the righteous, James the brother of our Lord. Um... Do you know who he was? He was leader of the Jerusalem church from 40 to 62 when his life was taken. But James was called camel knees. He spent so much time on his knees in prayer that his knees were so callous that they called him camel knees. When a man calls us to pray who is a man of prayer, we don't mind following the example. Remember Jesus, follow me, you will become fishers of men. You follow James and you'll be a man of prayer, or a woman of prayer, because that's what James was. He's not calling us to do something he didn't do. By the way, even with Jesus, remember nights we just last week, night, whole night in prayer praying before he chooses his disciples. I would like to ask you, I've spent nights in prayer with people, a whole bunch of those. How many nights have you spent total night in prayer just by yourself? The Son of God did. He needed it. And then James realized he needed it. And so here's James Camel knees telling us, listen, we need to pray. It's the only answer. That's why, listen, listen to what I quote for you, James 4. Whence come wars and fighting among you? Come not hence of lust of which war in your members you lust and cannot have, so therefore you kill. You desire and cannot possess, so therefore you fight and quarrel. He says, okay, you know your problem? You have not because you what? You ask not. The reason why we're so deficient in these areas of our life is because prayer is not the vital part of life, and yet it must be. James begins chapter 1 with believing prayer. He ends chapter 5 with believing prayer. The book begins and ends with this. Read the book through and don't even try to put the pieces together. And you'll begin to see one of five tying together. He calls us to believing prayer in chapter one, calls us to believing prayer in chapter five. Now, oh, Hallisby changed my life in prayer. He did way back when I was 19 or 20. Read his book on prayer. The, the thing that stood out for me is the essence of prayer is not the words he says. So Jesus says, don't be, you know, just repeating phrases. He says, the true prayer is complete helplessness and true prayer is complete dependence. You know, whenever we start out a day, you know, Paul says, pray without ceasing. This is prayer without ceasing. Living a life where you totally realize you're totally helpless and totally dependent. See, the trouble with going to work, and I've taught for 37 years, you know, you go in there thinking, I know this subject, I can do this thing, I can do a blindfolded. Pretty soon you see the sense is, I can do this, and when I need God, I'll call on him. He says, you know what, you better start out realize you need him before you realize you need him, because you need him up front. We get so used to doing this and see, we must realize even as we go to jobs we know so well, we're totally dependent and totally helpless aside from his intervention in our behalf. See, I just love Joshua when he learned the lesson. See, he marches all night to defend the Gibeonites because he's a crafty military man. He attacks him, and then God sends hail, and Joshua says, more men die from the hail than die from my men. See, I can be as crafty and good as I want to be, but God intervenes in such an amazing way to accomplish what I couldn't accomplish. He'll do that for you at work, my friend. He will. That's the point of all of this. So prayer is the issue. The need for wisdom is here. Now, now I, when you do any man lacks wisdom, this verse has been taken out of context more than almost any other verse ever. It's been used by so many students in Christian colleges when they went in and take an exam because they thought this was the catch-all, but that's not what this verse is for. There, there are, it's interesting because when we talk about this, there are four, at least four words that talk about wisdom in the New Testament. One of them is, is theoretical knowledge. This is, what, this is what students get out of school. Um, this fellow talked to.
out who was uh, worked in aircraft. He said the worst trouble he had was guys coming out of colleges with an MA degree in engineering trying to tell him how to do this plane business. And one day he's right near retirement and they were doing it on a contract basis to bring him back in. He says, I can save the company millions of dollars in how you do this fuselage. And they go to a guy who doesn't even have a college degree and they say, what do we do? And he showed them and they saved millions of dollars. No BA, no MA, just knows where it is. But I, I've taught for so many years, guys who go out of school, see, we know it all. It's amazing. That's one kind of knowledge. That's a Greek knowledge, by the way. There's a theoretical knowledge. That's a Roman knowledge. That's that practical stuff that comes, the, the knowledge by experience that you gain. It's, none of these are bad. There's intuitive knowledge. But there's this one, which is in this passage. It's applied knowledge. Read through Proverbs. I try to do it on a daily basis. Read through Proverbs. Wisdom, the wise man, is not a person who has the concepts up here. as a person who flushes them out in his daily life. That's Hebrew knowledge. A wise man, according to Hebrew thing, is a person who's able to take the things and apply them to his life. What are we to apply in this passage? Count it nothing but joy whenever you fall in the midst of trials. And you say, I can't do it. God says, I can enable you to do it. I can enable you to take that truth that you know that should be a part of your life, and I can enable you to do it. See, it isn't dependent upon you. It's dependent upon me. I can help you. You just need to realize you need help and come to me. I can do this for you. And this is the word that's used here. So if any man likes if any of you lacks the ability to take what you know to be right, in this passage, counting it nothing but joy in each trial, and apply that to your life. If you lack that ability, don't say, I can't do it. God says, I can enable you to do it, and I will. Look at the confidence. Let him ask from the giving God, and it shall be given to him. You know, it's interesting because the translation, let him ask of God who gives. That is a good rendering of this, but actually the way he puts it in, in Greek is to put, let him ask from the giving God. God is a giving God. God loves to give. By the way, we've been to Zechariah 14, but I want to talk to you about Zechariah 14. I go back there so often. God's going to gather all the nations against Jerusalem, okay, to battle. And they're going to come in in Jerusalem. They're going to destroy the city. They're going to, you know, take what they have. And then it says, and it looks like everything is a disaster. Then it says God shall go forth and fight with them as he does in the day of battle. God loves to fight for us. Why does it take him that long to fight for Israel? Because he has to bring them to the place of their realizing their helplessness before he, can inter before he will intervene. That's what God does. Israel has a great... Well, you're in Israel and you stand on that mountain and you watch that. They've got this uh, airport where the planes are underneath. They bring them up on, uh, you know, these elevator things. They come up to ground level and they take off. And you see jet after jet whirl over your head. You say, boy, I'd like to live here. This is good. Israel is so dependent upon itself now, but one day they will realize their dependence must be upon God. And in that day he will intervene. God loves to give. God loves to fight. God loves to do. Okay, I must go on. God will respond. He, notice what he says, though. And by the way, whatever your text is, let me just tell you the first word, God shall give to you, but not going to how he's going to do it unconditionally. The, the word, it's, how is it translated in your text, generously? The word could, should be rendered unconditionally. You're going to go to God. God's not going to have conditions. You know, if you do this or this or this, I'll do it. No, God says, I'm going to do it unconditionally. And notice the next word, he upbraideth not. You know what he doesn't do? You remember last time, you know, if, if, if somebody comes and somebody says, I'd like to borrow money. Remember last time you borrowed, you never paid me back? God doesn't do that to you. God doesn't say, remember, you failed me last time. He doesn't do that. God says, you know what? I will intervene in your behalf. But let him ask in faith, nothing doubting. You know, just some thoughts here with this. You know what? If you doubt, it creates instability in your entire life. If you doubt in prayer. Listen to this. The one who doubts in prayer is like the surf of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. Look at the next verse, verse 8. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. My friend, if you do not have a confidence in God in prayer, you will find yourself unstable in every area of your life. You'll be going up 
and down and up and down. It's going to happen because God said it. So you see, an instability in your prayer life leads to an instability in your personal life. It will. It just will. There's no way out of this. But now let me take you to the next part. In one's prayer life, ineffectiveness. Notice, let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. Listen, if you're not going to trust God and say, God, it is you I depend upon, not upon myself, not upon anything else, just upon you. If you come that way to God, number one, there's going to be effectiveness in prayer and there's going to be stability in your life. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Okay, now, the call to God. It's interesting because I want to show you verses 9 to 11, but watch this. Here it is in the Greek and English rendering. Verse 9 begins with this, and verse 10 begins with this, okay? The word and, okay? Then verse 9 says, let the brother. Then it says, let the humble brother, and verse 10 says, let the rich. It doesn't put brother in there, it just puts rich. Verse 9 says, let him boast. Verse 10 doesn't have a verb. It borrows a verb from verse 9. Verse 9 says, so let the humble brother boast in his exaltation. But look at, let the rich in his humiliation. Notice this relationship between humble in verse 9 and humiliation in verse 10. The poor man is humble in verse 9. The rich man must be humble in verse 10. Now, what's missing here is a verb. And I think the verb must be taken literally just like it is, let him boast. And I believe then the other word that's left out here, see, it's just like in English, when you go from one sentence to another, you don't, you leave out a word, you can understand the word from the previous sentence. So he leaves out the brother and leaves out boasting because he's comparing these two. They're both believers. One's rich, one's poor. So both of these are believers. It shows how believers, be they rich or poor, respond in faith to circumstance. You cannot trust God in money. Be you rich or be you poor. Now, may I tell you there? Okay, first of all, in response to the poor man. Notice, let him boast in his exaltation. You know, the trouble with those of us who don't have is that when we come to a time of trial, the difficulty is that we, we look, first of all, we think, first of all, of our bank account, and we look at that, and uh, it doesn't look too swift. Then, we look at our credit card, see how much credit we've got left, see? Then, when we've checked both of those out, realize there's a disaster on both of those, now we go to God. God says, hold it, you should have come to me first. It's not your wallet and your credit card, it's, it's just me, okay? I am the one who pays the bills. I pay the bills. And do you realize God, he says, I never ask for anything. Why? Because a cattle of a thousand hills are mine. So I don't ask for money. If I am representing God and God says, I don't beg for money, how should I do that? See, God says, I own the cattle of a thousand hills. Anytime I want, I can provide for myself. I don't need you. Listen, if you give to God, you should give to God generously. You just should. Understand, God always pays back in a big way. But, but understand, in the process of all of this, God doesn't need your money. It is the privilege of sharing of what he's doing, okay? But he doesn't need you to do. God can do by himself, thank you. He will not live a dependent life. So, so the poor believer, he has a God like this. In fact, I love Matthew 5 to 7 because it talks about your heavenly father, your heavenly father, your heavenly father. And in one section, chapter, it says that your heavenly father feeds all the birds. My father does that. Not the heavenly father, my heavenly father does that. If he can feed the birds, how much more you see I care for each sparrow, no sparrow falls, right? How much more do I care for you? Listen, if he takes care of sparrows, he's going to take care of you. If he takes care of the lilies of the field, he's going to take care of you. He will. But how about the rich one? The rich do the same thing. They look at their wallet and their credit card, and they look to God next. Because when they look at their wallet, it's different than mine. They've got money to pay. 
It's, uh, it's amazing because you watch them. They, they, they can do this stuff. They can pay for this physical problem. They can pay for that kind of problem. They can pay for anything. And they don't look to God like they should. But see, a believer must understand he is as dependent upon God as I am, whether he be rich or poor. And I've watched God take people who have a lot and take it all away and bring them back to their place of dependency. And God just has a way of doing that. So he says that. Let the rich brother boast in his humiliation. Why? Because, see, he can go around and pay all these bills, but when it comes to this, he must depend upon God. And by the way, let's take the physical trials. You see, the physical trials, you think you can pay for them to get better because you can buy the best to get the best doctors in the world? You know the problem with this? Only God can bring the ultimate healing. Let the doctors do what they will if God doesn't intervene. The healing doesn't happen. So now, when you look at this now, the consequence of all of this in verse 12, it's all summed up. If you look at verse 12, it's interesting because, blessed is the man who endures these variegated trials. Uh, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because once he has been approved, when God puts a stamp of approval on your life because of your confidence in him, it says you will receive a crown of life. Let, let me tell you about this. Um, to a Jewish person, and this is a Jewish person written to Jewish people, th this Stephanos, which is is, okay, is here. We get the word Stephen from it. It is interesting because it was given as a reward for those who won a race in the Olympics, okay? They got these wreaths or crowns. But see, that's not here because this is not a Roman book. This is a Jewish book. And they were anti so much of all the Greek trappings because it wasn't a part of what they believed it should be. So for them, though, it was a festal ornament. It was the person who was the honored person, whether it be the bride or the bridegroom or so forth like that. The bridegroom would have this, this Stephanos on his head. So I will translate as a wreath because let me tell you something. You talk about crowns. And then you go to Revelation, they're going to cast the crowns at Jesus' feet. The cra casting crowns is done by angels, not by men. Just, just trust me, it is. There are only 24 of them, and there are a lot more Christians than that. Uh, these are angels who cast the crowns at Jesus' feet. These are crowns, actual crowns that are worn by people in authority. That's not what we're getting, okay? And this idea that I'm going to walk down the streets of heaven, you'll have five of these, I'll have three of them, but we'll be jealous. But then what happens, we're going to cast them at Jesus' feet, so it won't matter. It's not what this is about. It's a genitive of apposition because what happens, the reward that God gives me is life. If I walk this way, God will give me a reward which consists of life. By the way, whenever you find it, crown of righteousness, it's a reward which consists of righteousness. Crown of joy, a reward which consists of joy. God's not going to give me some tinsel to wear on my head. Maybe he will, but that's not the point of this passage. He's going to give me life. He's going to give me joy. He's going to give me righteousness. And God's going to do this if I live this way. Why? Because he's promised it to those who love him. See, everything we do now points to eternity. Everything we do. And everything we do now must be done in light of eternity. The incredible eschatological nature of God's words is all about eternity. Why do I live this way now? Because of what God's going to do for me then. Are you with me? The future shapes the present. My circumstances aren't going to shape the present. God's faithfulness is. Right? And I'm going to trust in him. So you see an eschatological, joy-filled, faith-driven life. The eschatological driven believer's response to God ordained circumstances is going to be joyful, it's going to be confident, it's going to be faith driven living. May God help us this week to whenever we fall into the midst of variegated trials, we will at that point in time count it nothing but joy because we know from experience that the approved part of our faith produces endurance. Father God, we face trials, unbelievable trials. In each one of us, the trial is different this week. Uh, it's easy to look to man to fulfill that. It's easy to look even to the government to hope that they'll fulfill it. But, Father, we realize you are the one that fulfills all of these things for us. So help us to look to you exclusively in the midst of trials and see your intervention in our behalf. And when we come back next week, we'll rejoice because we'll look back and see all that you have done to bring glory to yourself 
as you through faith produce endurance in our lives, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.